Hello everyone, I am here with my third video covering a qualifier for my Class A 1v1 Championship this year. And I'm actually going to start this video off by talking a little bit about some of the things I'm tending to get wrong in terms of how I predicted how these games would go ahead of time. Some of the things also that a lot of you guys as viewers may be a little more inclined to get right than I am because of my specific background when it comes to Smash Up and the types of matchups and types of deck tournaments that I've tended to play. Just this past year in 2021, I was doing the S-Class overall championships, and if we look at the tier list for this, you know, the tier list I've got so far for the stuff in S-Class, there's a lot of stuff with power, uncapped removal, the ability to do big burst, and like, when I look at Ghosts and All-Stars, they're very good at doing big burst, but they're the All-Stars especially are sort of limited by the total quantity of big burst they can do in the course of a reshuffle, and that means that Ghosts and All-Stars are really good at targeting power left in play. Meanwhile, Cthulhu Alien Time Travelers with their uncapped removal are really good at countering power counters especially like if you return a minion with a bunch of power counters back to your opponent's hand you just kill off all the power counters so partially because i was just running the s class championship and partially because of the way i have tended to populate deck tournaments even earlier than this i tend to have a lot of decks that are something like robots garbage or aliens garbage acting as the gatekeeper rather than two good but not top tier factions that work well together, that means that I very much had this concept working for me that power counters, leaving power in play in general, is a very dangerous thing to do in a 1v1 game past a certain level of deck power. And that level of deck power does exist, but it's really that level of deck power is something that we would have been seeing in this Class S championship last year. And in A, a lot of the stuff that leaves power in play is good enough at working off of that power in play and bad enough at punishing, like the rush decks are bad enough at punishing you for leaving power in play, that leaving a reasonable amount of power in play is a fine way to play the game in Tier A. And if we look at these successful decks, we're looking at Fairy Avengers. I mean, the Avengers are five power bodies. They tend to sit around. Ignoble Elves, they are bursty somewhat, but they often want to leave a bunch of stuff in play before la launching their big burst. Avenging Knights... Knights in general have performed quite well so far. I want to say they've won 14 out of 20 games they've played. Knights are a huge leave power and play faction, and I'm going to talk about how that worked for the Dragon Knights in this episode, too. Exploring Princesses are probably the most not-leaving-stuff-in-play-centric faction that has made it through a qualifier so far, but even so, the Princesses leave five power bodies sitting around. So I've, that's sort of a mea culpa. I've been doing a little bit too much of that, and one of the things I'm noticing, because I had that initial wrong impression, knights are better than I expected, and if I look forward to some of the future qualifiers, I think also maybe Polynesians might also turn out to be a little better than I initially thought, because the factions that hard counter power counters are for the most part stuck in S tier and unable to compete in this particular series of tournaments. The other faction that I badly underestimated, at least so far, is the werewolves. I just didn't think they were that great, and a lot of the time I was thinking of how werewolves played in... before they got their titan, which was they had to play as a bruiser faction... But a lot of the time, their ability to play for having more power in play and that little bit of special on their 4 and 5 power minions just wasn't really enough to make them do well against a good deck. They ended up as a below-average faction that had some useful things it did. But the Titan really makes a big difference, especially when 
you pair the Titan with a partner faction that has something really nice to double. In this episode, we're talking about world domination from the Masters of Evil, which turns into basically two immortal first mates that don't help your opponent break bases on your opponent's turn, more or less when you're doubling it with the Werewolf Titan. On top of that, werewolves, they're great when their burst is bursty enough and their removal is bruisery enough. And in this tier, that's often the case. When I, If I were to try to play werewolves against something in tier S, they just get beaten down because their burst is not good enough when compared to tier S factions. And their removal isn't terribly exceptional either. Without them being able to get stuff really rolling with their Titan, their removal ends up kind of average. In this tier, when they've been able to keep their Titan in play, they can get minions large enough that Chew Toy can take out 5 power minions on a fairly regular basis. So werewolves, I suspect, are going to have a lot more success than I originally predicted. I was taking other people's bullish outlook on the werewolves into, account, into account when I predicted a B-plus rating for the werewolves. Now I'm starting to think probably they might be A. I don't think they're A-plus, but I think they're going to get past A-minus as well and make it to a normal A. So with that said, let's go on to the actual qualifier three that I'm talking about here. Um... Obviously, Ant Pirates is the big famous deck in this qualifier. It's been famous for a long time. They both got Titans, and what happened to them is they got outplayed. They got rushed down by Princess Teddies, and then Russian Ignobles hard counters them because Russian Ignobles can just steal the first mates. Or when something gets... Um, no, I'm sorry. They aren't winning by stealing the first mates. They're winning because when you stick power counters on something, Russian Fairy Tales puts that thing on the bottom of your deck, replaces it with a different minion that doesn't get to keep the power counters. So Russian Fairy Tales is your one huge power counter counter available in this tier. But the problem is that I'm seeing with Russian Fairy Tales, and Ignoble shares this power problem a bit, is that they've Russian Fairy Tales has a hard time against opposing removal. And that had a lot to do with why we didn't see Russian Ignobles making it out of this bracket either. But yeah, Ant Pirates got bad matchups. The Ant Pirates and every first mate pumping Pirates combo has two sources of significant variance. One of them is the quality of their draw is a huge deal for how fast they get a big first mate rolling, and the other is they need a matchup where their opponent does not have adequate answers to a big first mate. And Russian Fairy Tales has excellent answers to a big first mate, whereas, you know, Princess Teddy's doesn't have fantastic answers to a big first mate, but they just played the game a little faster. Our second deck that got knocked out early was Samurai Hydra. They are a perfectly fine deck they have good synergy. Samurai are not a very good faction, and so the good synergy was not enough for them to be able to perform in this tier. Um, if I compare them to Wizard Hydra, Wizards do fantastic, comes into play abilities upon playing twos, and have seven twos to power the Hydra engine. Samurai have a Leaves Play ability on their two, and the the problem with that is that Hydra is already has a good source of Leaves play abilities in Hydra Agent. So Samurai 2 is kind of competing with Hydra Agent to get sacrificed, and you end up not really getting great value out of what looks like great synergy. So as a result, you know, this this is why Samurai Hydra eventually went 1 and 3 and got knocked out third deck is Kitty Cowboys. Kitties just don't have enough of the right good actions to take proper advantage of Cowboys starting duels, therefore this deck was less than the sum of its parts. Unfortunately, I think a lot of Cowboys' best partners might be um, 
Innsmouth, rock stars, maybe even ghosts or aliens or Cthulhu or time travelers. Like, Cowboys has some real capacity to be an interesting support faction for a top-tier S-class faction. But I'm having a bit of a hard time finding the right factions for Cowboys to support in A-tier. Again, they may have some better partners coming up if I look at it, and if not, you know, I might come up with some better partners and add them to the brackets. Like, ninjas, I suspect, are also not going to have enough fun ways to use the extra actions from duels. You know, it'll sometimes be cute just killing the enemy minion with shooting stars or poisoning it before the duel, I don't think the synergy is going to be there enough to make them good. I'm actually taking a little bit at where else do I see cowboys down here? Ants? Ants has some capacity for synergy. Uh, yeah, I'm probably going to have to try to give cowboys some better partners. Because I, I feel like I whiffed when it came to figuring out what they'll work well with in this tier. Wizard Inca, out at 1 and 3. Now here, Inca looked great when I started playing it. Their rating has been dropping continuously since then. Why? Because Inca have a fairly simple and difficult to stop basic way of attacking a base. However, they have poor mobility when it comes to changing their target. Llama and Royal Highway just don't get the job done for flexibility well enough when they're building their power off actions that either require a bunch of other actions at the same base in armory or directly add power counters to minions at the specific base where you're playing a bunch of actions, as in Fortress Walls. Inca end up being very predictable after they start to hit stuff, and as I play against them more, I'm getting more adept at punishing this predictability. Therefore, I'm kind of starting to say Inca are going to be a great faction when you pull them out against someone who's not familiar with them, but they get worse as you play them more. In this case, Wizards are a decent partner for Inca. They help accelerate the Incas. The Inca tend to have a little problem with their attack being predictable in its speed as well as in where it hits. Wizard Extra Actions do help with this. Not as much as Steampunk just having some big burst actions that they can play, though. Ultimately, Wizard Inca is a decent deck, but not good enough at this level. Sumo Mages. Now, who did they lose to? They tied with the Grim Troopers and then got knocked for a loop by Dragon Knights. Dragon Knights was just a bad pairing for them. They went up against the toughest opponent they could have drawn after drawing in the first round. However, really, the game that got them knocked out was when they lost one game to Grim Troopers. Because Grim Troopers is a decent deck, but it's not on Dragon Knight's level. Sumo Mages is a decent deck. Um, I'm still having a hard time getting really good value out of top tier, I'm noticing Sumo, for making their engine run smoothly, really seem to want to draw their top tier early and work off it. And I'm also finding when you play against Sumo, targeting the top tier out of play is more important than you might think. Even though the top tier is only getting one counter at a time, getting the top tier out of play means that the whole Sumo faction is just a little bit slower in terms of its overall power output. By the way, an interesting thing I wanted to mention about Samurai Hydra. In their one game they won, they had a 20 power Shogun. I, I want to point that out. Samurai Hydra can get away with some serious murder if they drop Shogun on a high, very high breakpoint base early so that their opponent cannot afford to contest it. They can come up with some great flashy looking plays and look top tier for one game unfortunately they can't do that every game <laughs> so now on to the decks that got taken out in the third round you might notice if you look at how many decks are playing in each round this was the fastest that decks got knocked out it was faster than either qualifier one or qualifier two overall with only four decks playing the final round 
that's because there were a lot of good decks and only two decks that really were able to distinguish themselves. So we had a lot of draws, we had a lot of good decks sort of just crashing into each other and failing to distinguish themselves against other good decks. Grim Troopers is one of these good decks. It's good enough to beat most decks most of the time. The synergy is decent, but not exceptional. I really like um, Megabot synergy with the Grim Burst because it just adds a little bit to... We all know Grim is going to do these eight power drops with two of their twos that turn into fours. You know, they'll drop Hansel and Gretel. Megabot, on top of that, makes it that little bit better, which is useful and will often win them games. Ultimately, they're good. They're not exceptional. Russian Ignobles, I think I already talked about the problems. The one thing I found amusing in maybe a dark way was they got eliminated on, I think, exactly the same day the... Um, Russian forces stopped advancing in the Kiev region, which I, I thought was appropriate in a very weird way. Um, I probably would have thought this less if they were playing with someone other than the Ignobles, but let's not get into politics on this too much. <laughs> Greek, Greek Cree. Also a good deck. In this case, they were eliminated by a very good deck. What did they do? They uh, they drew with the Wizard Incas, but then beat up Kitty Cowboys. Greek Cree just work by... They double up on the extra power. It turns out to be a fairly synergistic combo. Werewolf MOE just does it better. <coughs> Zombie Critters we'll talk about with the last round. Finally, we're going to get the last deck that didn't make it out of here. We're going to get to Princess Teddies, because Princess Teddies went 4-2. You might notice I put a red mark on Zombie Critters in that match in that round, because Zombie Critters fell to 3-3 three and three and was, at that point, well, yeah, they're basically eliminated from making top 2. They're not going to go 6-2. and two. And if one of these two decks goes 5-1, and one, the Zombie Critters will have a worse tiebreak. But what happened was in the end, Princess Teddy's lost to Zombie Critters. Well, I'll tell you, I thought Princess Teddy's was a little bit lucky to go 4-2. and two. I don't think they're significantly better than the other most of the other decks in this qualifier. Princess has a lot of two-power minion removal, which matches up very well against Russian Ignobles. Nevertheless, they still lost one game in this match. Um, they did survive with a draw against Werewolf MOE, which was, again, a good result for them, because Werewolf MOE is a pretty darn good deck. And they beat Ant Pirates by rushing them, but ultimately, you know what? Zombie Critters got the better of them in the final, because Zombie Critters just had a better setup of burst, and Princess's two-power removal, the zombies didn't care about it. Okay, you can kill my walkers. I don't really care. Okay, you can kill Tenacious Z. It's just coming back. Zombie Critters had more burst. They had the sustain to survive through the removal. And so Princess Teddy sort of ended up looking like a simple rush deck. Zombie Critters also got some good plays out of Tadpore, which allowed them to counter just enough of the Princess's movement that Zombie Critters ended up the better deck this match and moved on as a wildcard option. Since they are tied with the Astronite Kitties, and I like the Astronite Kitties, there's a very good chance that I will go this deep in the wildcard options in order to get them into the championship. I also kind of like Elf Shark, so that might inspire me to go beyond the Zombie Critters. And finally, the top two decks. Dragon Knights won their first six games. They looked very strong in those six game wins. One of them against Zombie Critters was close, there was a situation at the end where they just didn't have a defender in play. And I think they were up by two points, but the zombie critters were at 11 or 12, something like that. And there was a point where if zombie critters had just a few more power available, you could say if I played zombie critters just a little bit better in the early to mid game, zombie critters would have been able to solo a base and win the game. 
With that said, I probably also could have played Dragon Knights a little bit better, and I think if I play Dragon Knights a little bit better, they are able to have a defender and play at that base, and Zombie Critters breaking it would have only tied the game and allowed Dragon Knights to go on and win. But in the final, in both games, something happened to Dragon Knights that did not happen to them against their first three opponents, and that is that at some point... They got Guinevere got target removed, limiting their movement a little bit. Something with Noble Steed on it also got target removed, limiting their movement a little bit. And this got them into a position where they had, in each case, three actions stuck on the same base, and werewolves were able to unload a burst on that base to discard three knights' actions from play in the same base break. Throughout the first three rounds, Dragon Knights were able to continue getting value from their actions as those actions stayed in play over and over because they used, again, I used movement intelligently with them and just didn't expose multiple actions to burst. And, like, the, I was able to defend against the level of burst that zombie critters could do or Sumo Mages, which is decent, but not great. And who did they play? Samurai Hydra does not have terrific burst. It has good burst, but not terrific. Against good burst, I was able to keep their actions pretty safe. Against Werewolf MOE, not so much. And that's because Werewolf MOE has a combination of Werewolf Double Talents, the crazy four-power extra addition from world domination and some very large black mambas as the game goes on and and that meant that werewolf moe once they get into the mid to late game can unload enough burst that dragon knights actually does get punished for leaving too much power in play but only against this opponent not against the previous three opponents and not multiple times per game. They only really got punished badly for it once. But that punishment was enough to make Dragon Knights lose the first game. And notice in order for the punishment to be good, werewolves had to boost up and kill one specific minion in Guinevere and a minion with a specific action on it in Noble Steed as well in order for them to get to the point where they can get those actions in a punishable arrangement. In the second game, Dragon Knights just barely were able to win it. They had to be the one with, like, an extra VP available in one of their cards in hand while MOE did it. And it could have just as easily been that MOE had an extra VP available in hand when they reached that 14-14 tie. But as it was, Dragon Knights had a fantastic performance by leaving power in play, they have great synergy between the two factions, and knights are looking very well, very strong. They have passed 1,600 on my live rating list. Werewolf MOE also has some great synergy. And in Qualifier 4, we're going to be seeing a 16-deck field. One of the things I'm doing is I'm noticing I've been going fast enough that I'm not really going to have... Like, I might finish all of these qualifiers before Disney comes out. I want to give the Disney factions a shot at Class A... So I'm expanding some of these qualifiers to both slow them down a little bit and leave a, a make a whole bunch of space in the later qualifiers for a whole bunch of Disney decks. So expect to see a bigger qualifier in Qualifier 4. And now I think I've been talking long enough. Happy smashing, everyone, and I'll see you in my next video.